Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Cause of the Week highlight. My name is Christy Kennel, and I'm one of the Associate Directors for the South Central Virginia and Albemarle Bay area for the Combined Federal Campaign. This week, we are talking about public safety. Many CFC charities deliver critical services to those in need and help with community issues, natural disasters, or violence prevention. Today, we have a selection of charities speaking with Ms. Ms. Julie Dudley, our second Associate Director for the South Central Virginia and Albemarle Bay area. I will let Julie take it from here, sharing videos and interviews with these organizations. Public safety refers to the welfare and protection of the general public. It is usually expressed as a governmental responsibility. Most states have departments for public safety. The primary goal of the department is prevention and protection of the public from dangers affecting safety, such as crimes or disasters. But it is also our responsibility to learn essential safety and preparedness information and skills. We have pleasure in having Steve Moore, Disaster Program Manager for the American Red Cross. Stephen, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Julie, for having me. We've seen many hurricanes and tornadoes that have been happening more this year than most, and I know you've been involved in a lot of them. What is the American Red Cross role during a disaster? Well, I think that the mission statement of the American Red Cross kind of sums it up the best and that we are here to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. And we can do that in a, a number of ways for disaster services, uh, which is one of the several lines of service of the American Red Cross. Um, we can do things like the disaster action team, which is where we go out and provide immediate assistance. Uh, to isolated emergencies such as home fires or isolated flood or uh, storm related damage. Um, we can uh, provide them with assistance so they can get into a safe place and get uh, immediate uh, needs taken care of. Um, then if something really ramps up and we have a lot of families um, uh, through hurricanes or just through straight line winds or anything that comes through with like tornadoes, um, we can provide emergency shelter, uh, feeding and distribution of emergency supplies. And there's also many support roles, um, such as damage assessment, where we actually see what the uh, damage level is so we can do our planning, um, information and planning, um, uh, logistics, and that is uh, everything from paper clips to vehicles, uh, staffing, uh, and then casework, and that helps with uh, individuals and families in their recovery planning and puts them in contact with our partners uh, so that they can get the resources they need to overcome any obstacles in their recovery. Um, we. Uh, can deploy nationally. Uh, this was an unprecedented year, as you had mentioned, um, where we had so many disasters happen, so it really stretched us thin. But of course, uh, uh, everybody was able to rally up and uh, be able to provide assistance to folks, and we're still doing that, uh, especially with wildfires in uh, Louisiana um, uh, with the hurricanes that came through. Um, but you can deploy nationally, um, and that's either in person or virtually. And you can also choose to stay at home 
Uh, we definitely need folks to still be home to handle emergencies here and be ready when the time comes. Great. And how do federal workers who have an interest volunteer? Well, anyone who has an interest in volunteering with the American Red Cross, the easiest thing to do is to go to uh, redcross.org and you will see a volunteer tile. And if you click on that, uh, you will begin the um, application process and begin your adventure as a volunteer with the American Red Cross. That's wonderful. Thanks, Steve. And thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule um, to be with us today to talk about the Red Cross. My pleasure, Julie. Always good to see you, even if it's through a computer. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> When a patient is diagnosed with a life-threatening disease or a serious health issue, their lives can be quickly turned upside down. And this is not the time to be worrying about how to get to an appointment or how to pay for it. We have pleasure in introducing Rob Alper, President and CEO of Mercy Medical Angels. Thank you for joining us today, Rob. Thank you, Julie, and good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, tell your audience about Mercy Medical Angels. Yes, and we're excited to hear from you. Uh, how has the charity been able to help through COVID-19? Well, interesting. Uh, we are, uh, to start with, the uh, world's largest charitable medical transportation system, and uh, we are also an organization that is, uh, if you will, one-stop shopping for transportation. We provide transportation on the ground with gas guards, bus, and train tickets, and in the air with uh, trips flown by volunteer pilots in general aviation aircraft and with free commercial airline tickets. I should add, all of the transportation is free uh, to the patient and their family. Uh, when COVID-19 uh, pandemic struck, uh, we had a dramatic reduction in uh, commercial airline demand because of the fear of flying on a commercial airliner. And uh, we shut down Angel Flight, uh, our volunteer pilot operation, uh, for a couple of months uh, until we could get our arms around uh, proper process with regard to keeping everybody safe, the pilots and the patients. So we had a um, large uh, increase in demand for ground transportation. Um, the interesting and distinguishing uh, aspect of Mercy Medical Angels is that we were able to provide uh, transportation to necessary medical care uh, through this period. I'm happy to report today that uh, uh, ground transportation continues to be a major component of our support. Uh, but Angel Flight is back in business. We're at about 80% of our uh, former uh, 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 trip uh, delivery, uh, measured year over year. And co the commercial airline uh, uh, trips are coming back as well. Yes. So what are the other programs that you, you may provide? We provide uh, programs for uh, well, let me let me start over. Uh, we provide transportation to ensure that no one is denied medical care because they don't have transportation uh, to get there. And uh, as you uh, stated so well in the introduction, uh, many times when you're faced with a serious illness, uh, 
the last thing that you want to uh, have to deal with is the expense of travel. Now, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, let's say that someone uh, living in Richmond, Virginia is diagnosed with a uh, rare disease or a serious disease uh, that is best treated by, uh, let's say, MD Anderson, where we do a lot of trips in Houston, Texas. And uh, they're told that, uh, yes, there's hope for your very serious disease. Um, go to MD Anderson and they get to MD Anderson and they say, yes, we can help you come on back every three weeks. Well, uh, you know, that can be very expensive. And particularly after someone is faced with possibly losing a job, possibly losing health insurance and so forth. So that's where we come in at Mercy Medical Angels. Awesome. So <clears throat> I know nonprofits all have stories, but is there one story that sticks out to you? Well, um, I joined the organization in uh, uh, 2007 as a volunteer pilot flying for Angel Flight. Uh, so my, <clears throat> my first trip with, uh, uh, for Angel Flight uh, is the one that sticks out most for me. Uh, I picked up a little girl in the New York metropolitan area uh, who had a very serious terminal illness and uh, flew her to Greensboro, North Carolina to attend uh, Victory Junction Camp which is a camp for kids that uh, was set up by uh, Kyle Petty and his wife, Patty, and uh, is, um, uh, is part of the Paul Newman Hole in the Wall Gang camps. And they have a complete hospital there and complete uh, medical staff so that if any of the kids do get sick, they can attend to them uh, right away. In any event, uh, this is an opportunity uh, for kids who are seriously ill to have a full camp experience uh, which they couldn't otherwise have because of their illness. Um, anyway, I, I picked her up in the New York metropolitan area. We flew to Greensboro and she got out of the airplane and she said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And all I could think was, uh, no, thank you for the opportunity. So that's the one that, uh, that sticks in my mind the most. But uh, we have many. Uh, there's one, and I'll be brief, uh, that we did uh, recently. And this was uh, uh, a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I got a, a call on a Sunday afternoon from a neurosurgeon uh, who is on the staff at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And he said, I hope you can help. Uh, I have a surgery to do in Tampa, Florida uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, I, uh, Southwest can get me down there, but uh, all of the uh, uh, schedule changes because of the pandemic and all of that sort of thing are changing things up. So I need to be back in Baltimore for another surgery on Tuesday morning. And so we were able to deploy one of our uh, Angel Flight pilots uh, who had a very competent airplane, a turboprop, up in Tampa uh, Monday afternoon, flew him back to Baltimore. As he said in his thank you email to us, uh, you know, I was able to get home, get a good night's sleep and have a successful surgery the following morning. So that, that was an example of uh, taking the clinician to the patient rather than the patient to the clinician. So it was sort of a new twist on what we do. Yeah, and we do what we can through COVID at the moment. Yes. So Rob, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Julie, and good luck with the, uh, with the uh, charity campaign and charity fairs this year. The public relies on the first responders during emergencies and the more substantial the incident or the disaster, the greater the need for assistance delivered by the fire department, the rescue squads and others with public safety missions. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Terence McGregor, Health Program COVID-19 Operations Center Coordinator for the LA County Fire Department. Prior to his appointment in LA, Terry was the former Chief of Emergency Services for Lancaster County and former Assistant Chief of Gloucester Volunteer Fire and Rescue Squad. Terence, the first responders are the lifeline in a person's life when there's an illness or a, there is a disaster, 
and we are seeing so many heroes throughout COVID-19. Can you tell us more about our first responders and how can we do our bit through COVID? Well, first responders today are there to serve their community in an all hazards environment. You see firefighters uh, performing the role of healthcare providers as paramedics. You see them working it with people having mental health crises. You see them working together with their partners in law enforcement to respond to their communities in a disaster when there's been a hurricane or tornado or flooding to help rescue people and get them to safety and provide them protection. So the role of the first responder really is more than, than what it used to be where firefighters just put out building fires and law enforcement officers just patrolled the streets. There really are social safety net. And in the time of COVID-19, they're affected in a significant way. They're continuing to do their job, interacting with the public. Um, and we've seen a lot of social unrest and demonstrations over the course of the past year. And it's put those personnel at risk because they have to be in contact with large numbers of people um, and potentially contract the coronavirus disease. Um, and then quite frankly, it, it tends to spread amongst those groups in fire stations and police stations. And so we're getting sick, our personnel are getting sick and it's starting to take a toll on us physically um, and, and mentally. Uh, so what can we do as a society to help protect ourselves and our first responders? And it's really just common sense approaches things that you can do to reduce the impact of flu season or any other infectious disease. Uh, wearing a mask, maintaining a physical distance from others. Um, mask wearing has unfortunately become controversial and politicized, but the reality of the matter is that a barrier between one person and another prevents infection from being transmitted between them. And it makes a huge difference. Other common sense measures like frequent hand washing, use of hand sanitizers and disinfecting high touch surfaces make a tremendous difference in reducing the transmission of the coronavirus and for that matter, any infectious disease. Thank you. Are all fire departments and rescue squads paid staff? Uh, in fact, no, um, 70 to 80% of the first responders across this country are volunteers. They're members of the communities that they live in and that they serve. Uh, in rural areas, they are the dominant uh, workforce for those public safety agencies, um, including in some law enforcement agencies. Um, in more urban areas, you tend to see exclusively paid full-time organizations, but on the whole, um, even in a lot of suburban communities, what you see is a mixture of the two. And many of these volunteer organizations not only volunteer their time and their service and their labor, they in many cases are even self-funded organizations that depend on donations and fundraisers to pay for their equipment to serve their communities. Well, Terrence, it was a pleasure in speaking with you. And we thank you and all the frontline workers for their service. Thank you, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak to my Virginia families. We'd like to take the opportunity to thank the organizations who were able to join us today. We are grateful for the work that you do within our communities, as well as the many other organizations part of the Combined Federal Campaign. It has been a pleasure working together to change the world. Remember, your gift can help protect communities and families by supporting dedicated CFC charities. Show some love and be the face of change at CFC or givecfc.org.